Hello and welcome to interest.co.nz. I'm Janae Tipsharani and today I'm joined by Professor Sean Hendy um, with one of our Double Shot interviews. Sean is the Director of Te Punaha Matatini um, Science Research Centre um, and is also involved with the Auckland University um, Physics Department. So um, today I'm fortunate to be joined by Sean, um, the head of the release of his book Silencing Science, um, which is due to be released at the beginning of next year. Um, so Sean has been researching the issue of corporates gagging scientists, essentially, um, from releasing, uh, you know, research of sort of public importance. And um, no doubt this this book will, will ruffle a few feathers, Sean. I think it already probably has. Just talk about it. <laughs> yes, it has. I mean, it, it, it is a serious issue, and it, it, it's something that is, does seem to be affecting a lot of scientists these days. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's a timely time to, to tackle this topic and, and bring it to light. Sure. Now, now, just what is the issue here? I mean, there are a lot of industries that have potential conflicts of interest with corporates and with government, but science is one of these ones which we've always thought really... I've thought of it as being independent. I mean, how is it not independent? Yeah, so you know, we the public puts puts over a billion dollars into its uh, science system every year. Uh, so we do have a lot of scientists that are that are funded from the public purse. Um, but of course, many of these scientists also uh, work for industry, and so there's there's often situations uh, where the, where scientists are, are both getting money from the public to do their research and taking money from industry and that that just naturally produces conflicts and and often part of the problem is not not just not necessarily just that, that, that industry funding can skew research but often with those with those industry contracts you know come confidentiality clauses so often you can find yourself as a scientist locked up in a confidentiality clause that prevents you from talking about something about where there's you know there's a great deal of public interest right so that's I mean hugely concerning um, for New Zealanders for our health all those types of things what are some examples of areas where this is happening well uh, the example I like to use is the is the Fonterra botulism scare which which almost uh, two years ago of course there was a was a false alarm uh, uh, but for, for a period of time um, uh, Fonterra was worried about the fact that they might have contaminated a, a large ba batch of, um, of whey powder um, with, with botulism um, and you know what happened at the time was of course that the, the a lot of the testing was done at AgriSearch. AgriSearch scientists couldn't speak out because they'd been doing that testing under a commercial contract. Um, we had a number of um, uh, experts in foodborne illness um, who initially were talking to the media, but then later on got signed up by the government, remarkably, in a number of um, uh, a number of inquiries. So they were muzzled from talking to the media. Suddenly, uh, we found ourselves in a situation where we just didn't have experts in New Zealand that could talk to the public um, about what was going on. And it really it came to a head when um, Gary Romano, who was a senior manager at Fonterra, went on Cam Campbell Live and, and talked about how they were they'd found botulism toxin in the in the whey powder. Now, if that was true, that was extremely dangerous to the public and, and should have resulted in an immediate recall. But of course it turned out it wasn't. Um, but the, the, the media only, by triple checking uh, and hunting down um, scientists, they were able, you know, the media was able to find that out. But we came very close to what could have been a catastrophic um, uh, screw up by Fonterra. And that could have done a lot more damage to New Zealand's exports than the, than the false alarm did. Sure. Now, there were um, a couple of scientists which were able to speak out on that topic. And how were they, you know, what was the response to them speaking out from yeah. Frontera and um, I guess from the science community generally as yeah, well? Yeah, so, so one of the people that, one of the people that, that did talk to the media and, and did say, hang on, you should, you should triple check what Frontera is saying because I don't think this is right, um, was a scientist called Dr Susie Wiles who was a science communicator and microbiologist at the University of Auckland. Subsequently, because she's not an expert in foodborne, foodborne illness, she's actually been criticised by members of the science community for speaking out about things on which she's not an expert. Now, there's kind of a there's a there's a kind of a code in science, an unwritten law in a way that that um, you shouldn't speak about matters where you aren't the the leading expert mm -hmm. in, in New Zealand. You know, we, we um, you, you know you shouldn't grandstand and talk about other people's research. But in a situation like this, 
you know, where every, all, the, all the experts were tied up um, through conflicts of interest or confidentiality, she stepped up um, and unfortunately was subsequently criticised. I mean, I think the important thing as, as scientists when you're doing that is, is you've got to try and represent your, your um, expertise accurately. So you shouldn't say, I'm the, I'm the New Zealand expert in this area. What you should say is, well, look, I'm a microbiologist. I'm not an expert in food bond illness, but actually I think this is, this is probably unlikely. And, and I, think, I think Susie did a good job, and it's, um, you know, it's unfortunate that there's been a bit of a backlash uh, in the science community. Mm. I mean, there's a fine line, I suppose, which is maybe the issue, and it's another issue which I've become aware of is, um, for example, in Taranaki, where there's all the sort of oil and gas activity, um, a lot of the research done into fracking and, um, you know, land farming and, and practices around oil and gas are done by the Taranaki Regional Council, and that is also the body that regulates and, and provides resource consents for companies to do that activity. Um, so, I mean, you could argue that they are the, the ones that have the expertise, they've done it, they understand it, but on the other hand, I, you do also question whether there needs to be a little bit more um, autonomy. Now, you know, in a small country like New Zealand, how do we sort of define that line? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that's exacerbated by the fact that we don't spend enough on science in New Zealand. We um, only spend about um, half a percent of our GDP on um, science and innovation, which is considerably less than um, than the OECD average, and much less than other small countries. Um, so we're, we're spending less on science. It means we have less independent mm. scientists, and often our scientists are do find themselves in this situation where they're, where they're not, not only the experts, the regulators, um, but but you know also have strong relationships with industry. So I think one thing is we do need to accept that we probably need to spend more um, on science to avoid some of these issues. Um, I, I also think we probably need some independent scrutiny. Um, so one. Uh, one thing I'll be suggesting in the book is that we could perhaps have a parliamentary commission for science and the way that we have a parliamentary commissioner um, for the environment who can speak independently about environmental mm. issues, um, perhaps we need the same sort of um, uh, thing in science, um, uh, uh, an office that can give an independent oversight of some of the science done um, around the country where there may be potential for conflict. Sure, all right. And um, I mean, the Minister for Business, Innovation and Employment, Stephen Joyce, um, I heard him recently on a Radio New Zealand interview further to discussion about this issue, um, really sort of downplayed the problem. Um, it was put to him that a survey had been done by the, was it the Science New Zealand Association, Association of, of Science, yeah. saying that 40% of um, those surveyed had sort of seen this issue of, of scientists being gagged. And um, Stephen Joyce dismissed this as being a problem. I mean, how do you feel about that when the minister is, is, has that sort of an attitude? I, you know, I think it's disappointing. I mean, the fact that it, it was an opt-in survey, so it wasn't a survey of all scientists. Um, Stephen Joyce is the only person in the country that has the resources actually to do that. Um, uh, so it's a bit, it's a bit unfair him, him asking um, scientists to do them themselves. Um, I think that survey shows that there's, you know, there are hundreds of scientists around the country who feel these pressures uh, and who perhaps think that they've um, that they've been gagged at certain times in their careers. And so that's a, that's a significant issue. Um, so I I would like Stephen Joyce to take this seriously. Of course, he's the person that's overseen the the transfer of science and innovation into the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. So it's quite clear that he sees science and innovation uh, as being about uh, growing the economy um, rather than, say, protecting the environment or looking after the public interest. Um, so I think we, again, perhaps he has a conflict of interest on this issue. Mm. And I mean, this is the thing, isn't it, Sean, so much of, um, you know, the industries that really make New Zealand money are, you know, have a, have a science base. I mean, the Fonterra situation, as you said, is a, is a clear example of that. So do you think there needs to be like a more forward looking sort of approach taken to this in science and in business? Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely, we, you know, we rely on science um, for our economy. You know, we're an advanced country and, and we've built our economy on good science, uh, you know, particularly agricultural science and environmental science. So science is, is really important to us. We can't afford um, to let its independence um, be, be damaged. Um, you know, we've got to ensure that we have good independent scientific research done in New Zealand. So, so I, think, I think we all need to take this issue seriously. Sure, right, and just, just one more thing. Um, 
how long do you think this has been happening for? Is this a sort of ongoing issue that, that's always happened or do you see it getting worse or better? Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I, we, we had a conference in April where, where we brought a lot of the people around, around the country, a lot of scientists, a lot of people from, um, from business and industry together to talk about this. And, and I chaired a panel discussion and, um, and, I, and I went back into the New Zealand Association of Scientists archives and I found we were having the same discussion in 1976. Um, and, and so it's, it's an issue that's always been with us. Back in those days, we had a Department of Scientific and Industrial Research. Um, these days, we have the Crown Research Institutes, and so this problem has sort of followed the Crown Research Institutes. Um, it's not a new problem. I'm not sure if it's getting any worse, um, although certainly the, the the dynamics have changed to a certain extent with the way the media, um, ha, you know, the, the media has changed itself. Um, but I think it's something we all, always need scrutiny. We've always got to um, keep an eye on this issue. Sure, right, and actually this is my final question this time. Um, speaking of, of that, um, you have spoken out about this issue a, a wee bit more um, sort of mainstream media over the last few weeks. Since doing that, what response have you received? Yeah, so so we've had a, a lot of um, uh, more scientists. This has raised the profile of the issue, and um, uh, we've had more scientists write in. Um, so ranging from uh, people who couldn't get can't get scientists to speak to school kids um, because of potential um, conflicts, um, even a through classroom, even even a classroom, yeah, which is which is really disappointing. Um, uh, through to through to more serious issues that you know I'll be looking to to, to try and find out more about as I as I write this book, Silencing Science. Sure. All right. Well, um, Sean, thank you so much for joining us today. That's a fascinating issue, and I think it's important to sort of shed some light on it. So, um, Professor Sean Hendy joining me today um, here at interest.co.nz.